of the parent doing work that we don't we never asked it to do we didn't didn't actually submit these statements they're all being done on behalf of of Oracle to try to determine what exactly is order master what are my options for querying order master so if you're familiar with the term recursive SQL all of this information here those are recursive calls those are queries to the data dictionary to do object resolution or to let the optimizer do its work so if I look at the amount of time this parse took a last time of 104 microseconds that elapsed time includes all of the children the, the recursive SQL that actually was active to do that parse so when you're looking at different calls and events you have to know what calls were were motivated on behalf of that call and do they fit in the sequence of events before or after my actual call and a lot of them actually occur before so again when you're writing your own profiler or you're looking at what's happening and you're reading through your trace file and you, you see these really odd queries these recursive calls you kind of learn that well what's that what's what's my big parse call that's occurring and that will be farther down in the list uh, we've talked a, bit, a little bit about cursors already Again, statements are parsed into a cursor. It really is just a pointer to a region of memory. Each cursor is given a number, so it's really easy to look at wait events, to look at your parses, executes, fetches, and associate those with a particular statement. The numbers are reused when a cursor is closed. So, for example, just as I showed you, there was a cursor number 7, but we had multiple cursor number 7s, when it's closed that number is reused there is a special cursor number zero it doesn't exist but events may be associated with it for example a calling program closes all of its own cursors but keeps the session open SQL net message your client will be associated with cursor number zero so don't be thrown if you if you do see that talk a little bit about timing um, timestamps if you see timestamps written into the time into your trace file you'll see them at the beginning of the trace file and you'll see them during periods of inactivity so what these can be used for is to if there's any drifting of elapsed time you can then correct it because your elapsed time may not always be exactly what the wall clock says there is some unaccounted for time that occurs for those views still on 8i or older the resolution is in centiseconds. So if you see an elapsed time of 123, that means 1.23 seconds. In 9i to 11g, it's in microseconds. So you have to divide the elapsed time by millions uh, of a second to get the actual seconds. So if you're going from 8 to 9, and all of a sudden your elapsed times just go through the roof, it may be that you have your resolution slightly off. Um, CPU time, Oracle cracks CPU time and elapsed time. CPU time is when you're actually on the CPU. It's basically an all or nothing. If you are on the CPU when the CPU clock kind of ticks, you get the credit for that full CPU cycle or the, the set of cycles. It's kind of like a digital clock. If you're looking at a digital clock or say the, the clock on your cell phone and it says 1127, you don't know exactly what time it is. You don't have that resolution of seconds. It could be it could have just turned 1127, or it could be just about ready to turn to 1128. Now, elapsed time is really like having a watch with a second hand. In this case, it'd be a watch with a microsecond hand. So you can actually see the elapsed time that occurs. If you're looking at a trace file and you see, you know, C equals, you'll tend to see you know numbers that that uh, are multiples of like 10,000 that's how Oracle keeps track of their time they don't actually count the number of CPU seconds that you're actually on the CPU uh, recursive double counting again if you're building your own profiler 
you need to be careful that if you're counting up your elapsed time and your CPU time, the times included in the children are rolled up into the parent. So if you're you know, looking at how long it took to parse that particular statement and you see it took 104 microseconds of elapsed time, those 104 microseconds, if you include all the elapsed time with the children, they're going to be double counting the time. So any child time is automatically rolled up into the parent. So again, if you're looking at timing information, do be careful of that. You need to know the parent-child relationships of your various cursors. Oracle, unfortunately, doesn't make that very clear. Sometimes you have to discern that just based upon the sequence of events. Now, what can happen is that your CPU time plus your wait time does not always equal your elapsed time. Time is 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 captured differently based on CPU and based on weight. So you're going to have some granularity issues. So you may get 10,000 uh, microseconds credit for being on the CPU, but you may have only used one microsecond of CPU time. Um, there are some significant differences that can come along if you miscalculate. So anytime you see a significant difference between the sum of CPU and the sum of your elapsed time, not equaling the actual runtime, you might have miscalculations. The other things that you'll find is that Oracle, because there is code that is not instrumented. So Oracle doesn't track the elapsed time that occurs there. The other thing that you can often see, and, and I'll have a case study of this shortly, are examples where you've got a, a CPU, a, a server that has two foo too few CPUs, and so you spend a lot of time sitting in the run queue for the CPU. Oracle doesn't track this information. It doesn't track that time, and it doesn't track, it only knows when you're on and off the CPU. So sometimes you can see significant differences. You can, again, use timestamps to correct some of this drift, but a, a time difference of up to 10, 10% is not unusual. And one of my favorite topics is always idle events. And Oracle does provide a list of here are events that are idle. And idle, they say, means that it doesn't contribute to the end user experience. Well, that's not always the case. So one of the common ones is SQL net message from client. We're told you can ignore SQL net message from client. My experience has been quite often SQL net message from client number one consumer of response time, probably 50 to 75% of the time has an impact to the user response, to the user experience. So an idle event is only idle if it doesn't contribute to the end user response time. I want to make that very clear. So identify, if it's, if it's quote unquote idle event, identify when it occurs and why it occurs. And if you can identify both of those and be able to truly say, no, this does not contribute, then it truly is an idle event. But do be careful. This is coming from uh, a DBA Zine article, Oracle Weight Analysis uh, Techniques. And notice he says, we have to filter out these weight events that are not helpful. I have to tell you this, SQL net message from client, SQL net message to client, more data to client, virtual circuit status, uh, parallel query DQ weight, parallel query idle weight slave, pipe get, I have all experienced those as being events that have contributed to problems. So pretty much the only truly idle events that you never have to really worry about are PMON timer and SMON timer.